Everybody see this stuff? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, <clears throat> Ooh, what's new? Welcome back, everyone, to our March meetup, the quarantine anniversary edition. Okay. So, it's been a little over a year since we've last done one of these things formally. So, there's that. So, we're just going to go like, you know, we didn't miss a beat at all and just go right talking about. Big Sur, iOS 14, iPad OS, and all the other OSs, uh, Office 365, uh, do some security roundup, items of interest, talk about the conferences, and then we'll let Joel take over and entertain us. So Big Sur. Uh, so in the last uh, month or so, we've got uh, both 11.2.2 and 11.2.3 released. 11.2.3 um, patches a very severe RCE vulnerability in WebKit. Um, and like it was announced, and I think what well, was like a couple of days later, we had 11.2.3 being pushed out. So um, if you're not on that and you're on Big Store, you definitely want to do that. Or of course, they also do some uh, security updates, but I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, 11.2.2 also addressed an issue with damage occurring when connecting to certain third party USB hubs and docks. Uh, including some of the ones I think Apple sells on the Apple Store. So yeah, <laughs> it's been fun. But um, I am enjoying the um, uh, the same versioning that's been coming with uh, Big Sur, so we don't have any of those supplemental updates. But of course, that means that we have at least another two years of uh, dealing with you know the uh, supplemental updates until. Uh, Catalina finally falls off the support list. Um, anyway, so there were no CVEs, actual CVEs closed in 11.2.2, but there, you know, there was one in 11.2.3, and this is going to be a pattern throughout all the other recent updates. So stay tuned. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, security updates. Uh, we got Safari 14.03 released for Catalina Mojave, and this directly addresses that the RCE vulnerability in WebKit. Uh, and um, going on to iOS 14, and well, I guess I got to make that logo and a better version of that logo. Anyway, so 14.4.1 was released, and this also patches that uh, RCE vulnerability. Um, and same thing for iPad OS. So I'm just going to go right through that. So yeah, Watch OS 732 was released and also patches that. I, there's all the links for there. TVOS actually didn't get an update. Last update was like 14.4, which was back in January. And um, that was just a big bug fix update. As you can see, uh, 13, 8, 38 CVs affecting 18 processes. That was the big major update, but they haven't had any point updates, which you know, was a little weird. But I guess uh, since it's really a stripped down version, they only really have a lot of. Uh, obviously, there's no WebKit and TBOS that we're that I'm aware of. But. <clears throat> so moving on to Office 365, uh, we've got uh, 1647, which was released uh, three days ago, two days ago. Um, and that's uh, details for that are up there. And also, we got auto update 433. So um, I know it's been a while, but uh, I think it was like in December's update is when uh, Microsoft released the um, universal versions of their apps. So all these are all universal. Um, so if you have any M1s in your fleet yet, uh, they should be running it natively. <sighs> So going on to our security roundup. So uh, this was interesting because when I was doing these slides and I told uh, the other, other fellows earlier that uh, almost till a year to the month, uh, when we last did one of these, there was another pseudo uh, vulnerability in Linux and Mac OS that was discovered. So, but obviously we all forgot about it because you know, coronavirus. But this is a new this is a new vulnerability that they discovered, um, and it is actually patched uh, as of I think, you know, with the last um, build of both ten fourteen six and ten fifteen seven, and I think eleven two two on Big Sur, 
both got that uh, pseudo version 1.9 P5, uh, which is where this was uh, patched in. So uh, if you're not on any of those versions and concerned about that, make sure you update as soon as possible. Uh, and of course, that severe RCE vulnerability in WebKit that uh, prompted all those other updates. Uh, those were the big things. There may have been some other things within the last month, but you know, you'll forget. All right, it sounds like we lost Serge. Uh, can everybody else hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. I, I yes. can hear you. Yep. <laughs> Probably yeah. Probably a bad ISP. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. Um, let's see if we can get them back. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> All right, some technical difficulties, but they'll be joining back up. Welcome back. Muted right now. Well, let him go for a bit until you tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted, Serge. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we start everybody muted. There you go. There we go. Can you hear me now? That's yes. Verizon, not Comcast. Come on. So, uh, <laughs> yes, we can. We're good. All right. Just you want to start that back up? Sure. Yep. All it's right. okay. We'll, we'll edit that out. <laughs> yes. No, we're keeping that in. We're keeping, we're keeping that in? Keeping it all in. All right. Let's go back to keynote here. All right. There you go. So uh, what, what did you hear last? Uh, RCE for pseudo, I believe. Oh, okay. At WebKit, yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'll just start over with the there you go. Matrix. Okay. okay. <laughs> so yeah, <clears throat> I mean, while uh, while since the last time we did one of these formal things, uh, we actually got a whole new release of Monkey. Uh, we're just going to talk about the latest updates, which was five two two five two three which mainly had some changes to deal with the, the differences in the Apple Silicon Max. Um, and uh, Mike could probably speak more about the, some of the major changes that uh, were involved in five, if you're interested. Um, also, uh, Auto Package 2.3 and 2.3.1 was released. 2.3.1 was a bug fix, but 2.3 added support for gamma recipes uh, for those of you who uh, would rather not deal with XML. Uh, which is probably all of us, but I don't know if anybody has the uh, uh, has the stomach to rewrite all their auto package recipes in YAML right now. But we'll see. Um, also, auto package version one point five seven was released. This was all, also a bug fix release mainly. Uh, if you were hit by that Azure outage on Monday, uh, you may be eligible for an SLA credit according to this Reddit thread. So um, I did try to look at it myself earlier to try and get the gist of it, but uh, there was some UI thing happening and it wouldn't display properly. So uh, your mileage may vary on that one. <clears throat> and if, uh, you know, just as a point of thing, this is an item of interest. I, we may have mentioned it before way back in the day, but uh, you should probably follow Mr. McIntosh's blog just to keep up or catch up on things that we might have missed here um, as he's been doing a bang up job of, you know, keeping abreast of what's been happening in the Mac and Min community, he even has a YouTube channel. So if you would like for, to consume his videos on that, that's also a good thing. So, and moving on to conferences. Um, so uh, there is going to be an objective by the C4 it's technically scheduled for an October, but no dates have been set yet. And it's gonna be in Europe. So we'll see if it actually happens. Um, and um, same thing with Macaduck. So Macaduck never had a 2020 conference and they're tentatively scheduled for something in October. 
And again, we'll see what they end up doing for that. Um, hopefully it's going to be one of those online things so we can all chime in, but uh, I'm not too confident about how the British are handling the pandemic to say that if they have something in person, you should go. But you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, no dates yet for WWDC, but we can imagine they'll do what they did last year and have a completely online conference. <coughs> um, and there is no announced date for the Mac deployment conference yet, um, but you can follow the link to see, to keep abreast of when they may announce something. Uh, Mac DevOps YVR uh, is doing another online conference this year from 6.9 to 6.11. Uh, registration is open and they have a call for speakers out. So if you're interested in speaking for them or interested in attending, uh, you just follow the links and that'll get you that'll get you there. And the PSU Mac admins are doing another one of their campfire sessions this year, starting on 629, I think going to the end of July. And they're also calling for speakers. So uh, if you're up for that too, the link is there as well. Um, Max Assessment is to be determined. Uh, they'll probably do another online thing again, but uh, it's one of those stay tuned and uh, wait for details for now. Um, doesn't look like Mac Tech had anything last year. Uh, and so they're to be determined and we'll see if they actually have something this year. Um, and of course, Jamf Nation has already announced that they're having another online conference this year from October 19th to 21st, and there's currently a call for speakers for there if you're interested in that. And uh, with that, I am going to turn this all over to Joel, who will dazzle and delight us, I'm sure. With, with that as a uh, intro, uh, now I yeah. gotta figure out what to do, right? Um, well, greetings, uh, I enjoy, as, as sucky as COVID and everything is, I appreciate the BYOB aspects uh, <laughs> of these meetings, that at least uh, that's there. So I, I have, I'm finishing up a dirty onion martini. So if I chew on some jalapeno olives or onions, that's uh, what's going on. And then I have enough. I'm, I'm glad you're, uh, you're in Minnesota rather than here. So I don't have to smell the onions. <laughs> and then I have the final pint of a keg of clown shoes uh, that we shall be drinking as we go through this. But a uh, <laughs> um, couple of things to show off. We'll do the least interesting and maybe most functional ones first um, as we go through that. And None of these will have anything really to do with Jamf. And I think it is, would be a Gibson if you put a, it's a dirty onion martini. Um, is that called a Gibson? I think it's called a Gibson. I, yep. I do it because it's what I've got the last in the fridge. <laughs> and can I share a screen? Will it let me? Or yeah, you, you should me? be able to. Hey, look at that. All right. There we go. So first things first, we'll talk about Nomad real quick. Because uh, uh, especially since somebody's wearing a Nomad hat. Um, I won't call him out too much, uh, but he's repping the brand, which is fantastic. Uh, we've been playing around with Nomad 2, uh, which I almost didn't think was going to happen because I, I didn't think it needed to happen. Um, but then Apple didn't really do maybe as great of a job as they could have done on some of the built-in stuff which then makes me think that maybe this is necessary uh, from at least a functionality perspective or at least an alternative, right? Um, no matter what choice you pick uh, and you know, pick the right choice 100%, uh, it's always nice to have multiple choices to pick from. Uh, or if you're getting started with Swift, this is maybe a fun kind of project to look into because uh, it is a little more kind of admin-y, right? It's not a uh, Space Invader game or some sort of recipe organizer uh, that some of the other Swift projects are. Plus it's also Swift on the Mac, which is not really a big thing that you see a lot of, right? Um, and Nomad hats are kind of few and far between. So if you're trying to get one, uh, I actually, although there may be a box in that closet back there, um, I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I've tipped my hand too much. We had a bunch of red t-shirts left over that I don't think we've done much with. Uh, but all right, so let's talk about Nomad. Spent a few minutes there, and then I've got some FIDO things. I've got some certificate things. 
I've got some iOS things. I'll keep talking until my beer runs dry uh, or you stop asking questions and it looks like you're all getting bored. That's the nice thing about having the videos here. Uh, so this is Nomad, uh, Nomad 2, duh, right, uh, dose. Um, and the big kind of differences that we had here is that it does have multiple accounts. Um, particularly if you're a consultant, this maybe wasn't the biggest of concerns for individual users, but if you were a consultant, you probably had a desire to have multiple accounts out there so you'd be able to sign in. Um, and if you're an admin, I think it's handy as well. Uh, some shops uh, are better than this than others with having actual role-based admin controls uh, to be able to have you get elevated credentials based upon who you've signed in as. And you may have an admin account versus your daily driver. And so this would easily allow you to switch back and forth between those. Um, the more interesting thing, and this didn't work on the demo I did yesterday, so I'm going to start with this, is that we do have a fully functional, whoops, so this is a IIS server that I've got, as you can see by the pretty IIS basic page, and I've got a curb authorized site on it, and if I go there, this is the single sign-on extension. Um, so that's kind of the, one of the bigger new features of this is that it does have a single sign-on extension. I don't know how useful it is. Um, I'm kind of annoyed. It would have been greater if uh, more single sign-on extensions actually got out there, right? But what's going on is I'm going to a web page that requires Kerberos authentication. I don't currently have any Kerberos tickets. So the single sign-on uh, extension pops up, which looks amazingly like, and this gets kind of inception-like, the uh, Nomad single uh, the sign-in window, because it is effectively the same thing. It's just coming from a slightly different piece of code. And so here we would actually be able to sign in and get tickets uh, in the heat of the moment here. So if I just hit sign in, because uh, I've got my VPN up and now I've got Kerberos tickets and I signed into that web page. So the usefulness here is if you are on the domain, or I guess you don't have to be because you could have services that use Kerberos that aren't on the domain. That's a little out there. Um, and you don't already have tickets when you go to use those uh, credentials in Safari or anything else that using URL sessions, which is pretty much Safari for what you care about, you would get that pop-up dialogue that would allow you to sign in. Uh, it does share a keychain with Nomad. So all those are in there as you would expect. Um, and then now I have a ticket. And if you look back up here, you can see that I'm signed in now. Uh, and that's the other new thing about Nomad is you do have the option to sign out as a particular user, but I could still sign in as somebody else. So if I go over here and now in the username field, it's got this little, I got to find a better icon for it. I was trying to do something to indicate that you already had a ticket for that user. Um, and so we have a little bit of a play button here. Um, and that way, you know that I've already signed in as Joel. Maybe I, maybe I don't need to do that again, uh, but if I did, uh, it would be fine. Uh, so I've got that option, but I can go down here and sign in as a test user. And then I will have multiple tickets. Um, so this is going out and we've got a little bit of a delay in here. I got to figure out in uh, why this is going on. Uh, so while that uh, goes there and you can see here's some stuff going on in the background, um, we can talk about with the preferences, we do still have a single user mode. So if you did like how Nomad was before where there was no concept of multiple users, you could still go back to that without any problems. Just click that single user button. That will all be manageable through preferences and everything else that you have in there. Um, and then since we are in a multi-user environment um, and we got to put a little thought into this, we do have the ability to kind of pull down and sync a selective user because it makes no sense to sync multiple <laughs> accounts to your local user. I mean, we could, uh, but you may be cycling passwords an awful lot more than you expected to. Uh, so then you'd have to be able to pick one particular user out of that list of accounts that you have there to be able to then go ahead and do that synchronization with. Uh, but otherwise than that, I'm hoping to keep all of the preference keys the same or at least as same as possible um, and then the other kind of big new changes to it, uh, if I go in here, I do a default read, uh, it's menu nomad nomad. So no more true source labs, which doesn't even really remember that uh, nomad was a product because <laughs> it's been a few years since I've been there. Um, here's the accounts. This is a big old data blob where we keep a P list of all the accounts that you have set up from the accounts window in there. Uh, so that's in there. Uh, and then we have a state domain 
And so we've got two separate preferences domain. A state domain is where all of the user record information goes once it's been looked up in AD, when it comes back down and you've signed in. And so here you can actually piece this out. You can see everybody that's ever signed in through this version of Nomad, this copy of Nomad, uh, all the groups that they're a member of and everything else. Plus right at the top, I will give you the current user that signed in. Uh, so that way, if you just want to look, it's really quick. You can do a default read of, you know, user password set date, for example, and you'll get immediately the user password set date. But if you know the specific username you're looking for, or you want to have an extension attribute or something else like that, you can read in through all of the users that have signed in and all of their attributes that are there. We wanted to make it very easy for you to parse that information. Um, so that's in that there. Um, other than that, if I go back to the sign-in window, and this is for David, if I take, I've got a YubiKey here. I've got a couple of them, actually. We'll talk about some of the others later. Uh, but if I have a smart card and I plug that smart card in, um, you will see this change to pin uh, so that you can actually do a PK init operation and sign in with a smart card or some sort of certificate uh, there. And you can see these are the two certificates on my card. So this is different than the users that I already set up. Uh, and if I pick one of them and click on the cert button, I get a nice little cert um, investigator panel so I can take a look at what's in there. Uh, so that's in there. This works both for the single sign-on and for um, the normal sign-ins. And everything that's in here right now is in the beta that I kicked out uh, yesterday. Uh, so about 24 hours ago in the Nomad channel. Um, we'll be there. Uh, so that's in there. Um, what else to talk about other than that? Um, you know, again, I don't know how many folks, I didn't think a lot of people would still be using Nomad. If you are, I'm very excited and very happy that you are, but I thought by 2021, maybe we would have gotten over 80, <laughs> but that seems very much not to be the case. And we keep the, I mean, I kind of keep track of the number of people in the Nomad Slack channel as just kind of a rule of thumb as to what usage it's getting. And it's higher than it's ever been. Um, and I think there's still a significant amount of people out there who are using um, still on-prem AD and they've got to be having a, a hell of a time right now uh, with everybody being remote. Um, and that's the other thing that we're kind of looking into um, what can we do to make this maybe a little bit more easier for these heavily remote times and what you might be doing with them. Uh, the other thing, and I won't show it because I haven't finished writing it yet, but we do expect to have a sudo, uh, a PAM module. PAM module is redundant, pluggable authentication module. But if I just say I have a PAM, that sounds weird. Um, so we will have a pluggable authentication module for this. So you could go down to the command line and do sudo or something else, uh, either with a smart card, if you got that, uh, we'll put that in there, or you'll be able to then authenticate as somebody from AD that's not a local account. And that's what's maybe most interesting for admins. And unlike when you try to do this with the, um, the locks in system preferences, right? Because if you haven't run across this, you should probably know this if you're still dealing with AD. If I go into one of these locks and you're bound and I click on this, it gets Kerberos tickets for your AD user and it leaves them there. Uh, so when you walk away, whoever, whatever user you are helping maybe still has your admin credentials can hit file shares and other things like that. So when we do this through the command line, through the PAM module, uh, we would just be getting a ticket to validate that your password was correct and then immediately killing that ticket. So in this kind of flow, you'd be able to go down here to the command line and you do, you know, sudo uh, dash s or whatever it is that you want to do. And we can actually prompt you for your Active Directory domain name because uh, you'll have a dialog that comes up. We're looking if we can do this directly on the command line, but I think I'm going to have to have an actual bit of UI. So when you did sudo dash s from the command line, you would then see effectively the same login uh, screen pop up where you would then be able to type in whatever your AD credentials are. If those succeed, we'll be able to validate the group that you're in from AD. So you'll be able to say members of these groups are able to do uh, sudo operations on these machines uh, and they have no real bearing or relation to who's an admin in AD. 
right? We're just looking at group names. So if we can get a successful AD authentication, we pull all the groups that you're a member of. And if one of those groups, uh, here we go, you can see I've in three groups there. If one of those groups is what's set up for sudo, you would be able to sudo and authenticate through. So hopefully that's interesting. Um, we're also got some branding in here. Um, if I go back to the sign in window, you can see that we've got a big uh, graphic. That was another thing. How do we make it so people don't think they're being fished? Uh, well, we make it a little more professional looking, make it have specific, um, you know, graphics and branding and other things from your uh, environment. So that's one of the things that we're looking in here uh, that we've got that. And again, this whole thing would be uh, specifically with the PAM module, uh, but for everything, um, we don't care if you're bound or not. We just have to be able to reach out to AD and uh, to be able to authenticate then against your domain controllers. Uh, so with that, I'll kind of pause. Um, uh, so a couple of questions. Will some of these make it to Jamf Connect? Jamf Connect should have most of this in it already. Um, I'm not incredibly involved in the day-to-day -day work on Jamf Connect anymore. So I'm probably not the best one to ask. Um, but yeah, they usually like to crib from my code, uh, at least as a way of seeing how it could be done um, and add those things in there. Uh, Jamf Connect already has a PAM module in it for going directly back to Active Azure or whatever your cloud identity provider is. Uh, so what you'll see from Nomad 2 will be very similar, uh, just 100% uh, going back to uh, AD uh, in there. Um, Cool. I'm looking at anything else. Yeah, a couple of you poor bastards still have to deal with this on a daily basis, don't you? Yeah, uh, we do. We, yeah, <laughs> some of the questions uh, we have, I took a note of them, so you don't have to scroll back if needed. Um, so one I asked was uh, that logo you were talking about where it says Nomad, can that mm -hmm. be customized or is that only Absolutely. available in code? Absolutely. Um, this will just be point us to a PDF uh, GIF uh, or some other graphic file. I'll even click the box in Xcode so that if it's an animated GIF, uh -huh, mm -hmm. you will see the animated GIF uh, here in the app. Um, so you'd be able to do that. Great. Uh, little, this was more of a comment that a question, would a green status of the NS text field be better at showing active curb ticket status? Probably, right? That was probably Tyler that said that. Um, <laughs> maybe I guess, right. Um, I, I think so. Uh, the green, red, right? I'm a little cognizant of green and red. I'm not colorblind, but I know folks are. So I was trying to find something that visually represented it, even if you couldn't see the color differential and it's not just a bunch of round circles, right? Um, so I think that's why we kind of went with the play uh, icon here. Although that's the play button is flipped. All right, that's my dyslexia showing up. So uh, we, gotta, we gotta account for that as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, or even better, right? Let's make it customizable and then it's not my problem, it's your problem to pick the right one. <laughs> uh, Cause it could be an emoji, right? It could be, I don't know, the mind reels as to what emojis might be out there uh, that you would use for being signed in and being on the domain. The other thing I've kind of got to figure out, uh, this user, um, if I sign in as this one, let's see if my VPN is playing nicely now. Uh, that's what was going on earlier. Um, and I can authenticate. I, I will put your countdown up at the top here as to uh, how many days you have left. If you have multiple accounts signed in, it gets a little bit weirder uh, as to what date to put at the top. Because uh, how do we put something very simple that says maybe there's multiple you know dates that are available here? Uh, so we've got to figure that out. Let me bounce this VPN and see if this helps. Um, so I can kind of show that in there. Uh, but yeah, when we went back to the old school caribou icon, just so if you're testing with this, you kind of know it's there. Uh, completely different preference domains, as I mentioned earlier. So if you are using Nomad 1 now, you can throw this in there without any problems. Uh, and it will be fully universal. Um, the only thing that we lose in that, um, if you are getting the certs via RPC, right? We've got two methods in Nomad right now to get certificates from AD. One is the kind of old school web uh, scraping. The other one is RPC. Uh, the RPC codes from Tim Perfect. Thanks, Tim. Uh, and I think what he did there and some of the black magic he did to make that work, I don't know that that would work on Apple Silicon. So that may be the one thing that we don't have from a feature perspective that wasn't in the 1.0 series uh, that's in here. Um, but uh, any other questions? 
I don't think there were any others in the chat. If anybody has anything, mm -hmm. speak up. Uh, Joel, this day mm -hmm. again. Just more, mm -hmm. more, more of a comment. When, uh, when you were more involved in Jam Connect and Jam Connect mm -hmm. and IT and everything, um, um, I was just wondering. There, and it's not a big deal because we deal with it. But when we trust it in the app, trust a certificate in the app, yeah. we then have to go into key change and trust it again. It doesn't say always. So if I set it to always trust, and then I go in the keychain, it still says use interesting settings. And again, it's not a big deal. It's just one more. Step. Take a look at that. I'll uh, I'm making a note right here. But it, uh, again, it's just one more step. Um, yeah. No, you, you should that, have to deal with that. I, you know, it's one more. It's again, we were, you were kind of writing it as we were going, literally. <laughs> and like I was confirming it with you while I was driving. I mean, it was. It was you know, <laughs> Those were the days, weren't they? <laughs> it wasn't that long ago, to, you know, uh, but. Um, it was 10 years ago, man. That's how long last year lasted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Gav Connect PKNIT um, doesn't have the volume of clients, obviously. No. So it's That's why I'm rolling some of that in here. So I'm happy for you to take a look at Nomad 2 because yeah. anything that was in Jamf Connect PK and Knit, I want to put into here. So you've got a nice place to go. You've got the code. If you need to tweak it, maintain it, something like that, you'll actually have all that the code be base. Great. And you'll have some flexibility with we're it. We're on build 72, and it's been like that for since the pandemic. So, and it's kind of like they don't have much of an opportunity to go back and, and yeah. start doing it again, especially with the, especially with remote, with, you know, all these, you know, cloud identity and everything like that. That's where the bread and butter is right now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's working great. It works even with the even with the. Yeah, bump. but you want something that you know is going to be looked at in the you future. Know, the only other thing I want to share with you, Joel, is that um, changing a password, and we fought and fought and fought this with uh, with. Um, uh, I'll say I'll say Mike, uh, uh, over. Okay. It. Um, and we fought this in terms of trying to get it to work because the code was exactly the way it looks on Nomad. Mm -hmm. and, when we went to go sync a password, it would not do it. We had to sign out, then sign back in, and then we would get the sync. Interesting. Okay. okay. So once you did that, it was fine. Yeah, so but that's still awesome. Stuff, like but, but if you look at the code, it's I'm looking at the code here of what you just did. Mm -hmm. You should see it. It's exactly the same. Sync local user. <laughs> it's not that hard. Yeah. But for some reason, it wasn't they were doing it. And the... And um, so that, that was that. And the last thing I just wanted to share just in terms of um, when I check with it, we have uh, Cisco AnyConnect VPN mm -hmm. um, and it's split between two sites, although they now have an appliance for load balancing. Uh, it's probably F5 and I'm not sure. Um, when I get that Kerberos ticket on a lot of machines, it'll allow you, it'll see all the policies and everything like that but it takes a while for the full weight of that Kerberos ticket to come down. Like if I click on status, mm -hmm. and this is only via remote, by the way. If I'm on mm -hmm. site, it's instant. But if I'm if I'm on remote on some machines, not all of them, I will I will hit status and the and the and the password, the password, the number of days, it's not there yet. In another 10, 15 minutes, it will be. Okay. So there's a little bit of a delay there. Sometimes when I hit renew ticket after I sign in. Yeah, like that better. It kicks it. Sometimes it doesn't, but within yeah. 15, 20 minutes, it does. And that's just living in a remote world. That to me is not an issue. It's because it, it should be cleaned up. But 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 those it's just it's it's in delay basically. It's what it is. Yeah, that's what it needs to do. You can get to your shares. You can get okay. to your single sign-ons. We use Ping Federate as far as single sign-on, mm -hmm. which is great. But um uh. So it will, it will allow you to do that. It's just all the information doesn't come all the way down for like 15 or 20 minutes. It's just a little delayed. And that's, that's it for me. Those are like the three things okay. we're dealing with. And so, you know. Well, I'm we're so I'm very interested in making sure that we address that um, in this because you're absolutely right. I mean, as, as one of the couple of customers that are on that PKNIT uh, app, this I think is a nice way of you going forward. Get it for free, which is kind of nice, maybe. Uh, not that that's maybe your biggest issue, uh, but you also have something that you'll be able to play with, poke at, 
um, you'll be able to see all the source code. Uh, and it was also part of it was just being feature complete, right? Because the Apple single sign-on extension does have some certificate functionality. Yeah, well, that's the other problem. <laughs> I mean, it's better than what it was. There's more uh, support. I say that very liberally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we still have to go enable it. And then um, there's a little bit more to it, but really without your product or without any third yeah. party, not going to work with smart badges you need especially since the crypto token kit doesn't even understand keychains because it's legacy to it yep so um and of course we've been sending out UB keys because max can't have active client so yep. i reset pin well i can reset pins but i can't enable the freedom certificate on the card so those are the things that i deal with on a daily basis but why well, you pay the big bucks product it's great to see you again joel it's, yeah you know, uh, but I'm glad to have your product because even with all these issues, it's really, it's there. I have other bigger issues. To <laughs> this isn't one of them. You know, this isn't one then of my them. job is, is at least somewhat complete in that somebody else is a bigger pain in your ass than I am. This, this uh, that's a <laughs> they sign in. It's, it's they, as soon as they get to the desktop, they sign in either with their mm -hmm. card or without it. I don't care. They want us to use the card. I don't really care, but um, because we're all local accounts anyway. So how are they going to know? But uh, uh, but yeah, once they sign in, they're good to go. So really, it's it's a pretty smooth product, even though you know. And I'm looking forward to testing Nomad too, uh, to to see exactly how Ooh, much better. Yeah, please take it. You know, like I said, it's it's currently in. Everything that I showed you right now is what's in the latest beta that I put into the uh, chat uh, oh. a little bit ago. So you're, uh, you're more than able to, to play around with it and take a look. Uh, uh, I like that Nomad 2 Electric Caribou. Uh, That's got to be your code name. So That, that does kind of flow. Very um, well. <laughs> so I actually have a quick question for you. Um, yeah? So the, the reason why we don't use the built-in SSO Kerberos extension for macOS mm -hmm. is, is very simple. Um, we can't... Um, so it doesn't do one thing that Nomad does, and that's uh, you can't enforce login, right? So when you... Really? So on the SSO curb extension for that's built in, if you set it up, you can, you know, when you connect to um, your VPN or your network, it pops up and says, hey, log in. But a user could just click cancel, right? And it won't log yeah, them in if they don't it. want to. And then they don't have to. But you will also, the user, even if they do log in, they can hit sign out after yeah. they're done. We want to enforce that. I am hoping that Nomad 2 will still have that same functionality that Nomad does where basically you can Absolutely. have that persistent login. Um, and like I said, a lot of those keys, I hope to be exactly the same. So the key to hide the sign out menu, for example, you won't have a choice. Right. It'll always be there. Um, and then, you know, we can get as annoying as you want to. I know we spent a fair amount of time in the later parts of Nomad in making sure that the user was bothered in a significant way if they didn't actually sign in and uh, perform the expected behaviors. And so part yeah. of that, you know, is popping up the, the dialogue boxes and the alerts and everything else like that. So absolutely. I mean, the good news about that is um, the Nomad 1 code is pretty battle hardened around some of those things. And so my expectation is I'm just going to get lazy and cut and paste a lot of that and move that over. Um, the places where we've gotten, you know, new code uh, are specifically around the AD lookups and then some of the UI stuff. Um, Cause you know, David, what you were talking about earlier and some of those kind of delays, especially when you're off the domain, uh, I know have been in there for Nomad for a while. And some of that, some threading stuff we're gonna clean up um, and so that. And what's also nice is that the AD engine in Nomad 2 is the AD framework, the same one that Nomad login uses. So we've now kind of coalesced those two together. Uh, so that you should be able to have uh, all of that functionality in one place. And with that, um, let me share a few other things. So this is where we get into the much more experimental time. Uh, and hopefully you still got uh, some liquid in your glass uh, as we can kind of play around with. But uh, I got a little project I've been playing around with lately. Um, who's using Fido keys? No, oh, no hands. No. <laughs> no. We're looking, wow. we're looking into it. You're looking into it. All right. Well, yeah, we're let, moving to UB eventually. Okay. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because I think there's some fun things here. Um, and I've got a newer version of this app. Uh, it's, it was kind of funny. I made this app because um, I was kind of angry at Apple. Um, and 
Uh, we do some stuff with Fido keys, but uh, Apple's got some of it built into Safari, uh, which is great. And you can actually use those and, and maybe we'll actually start there. So if I've got Safari open, I'm just bring up a new Safari window and bring this down here. And so this is, uh, I think I'm on one of the betas, but this has been in here for a couple of weeks, a couple of months. So I'm on 11.3, whatever, beta four, I don't know, whatever came out a couple of days ago. Uh, but one of the nice places to go to is you can go to webauthn.me, if I spell off correctly. And this is a nice handy debugger for you to kind of play around with uh, Fido keys. Uh, and in this case, so FIDO keys, for those of you who don't know, they're any of these Yubi keys, right? I've got a collection of them here. Um, yeah. You've got some third party ones. Uh, here's uh, one of the Google ones, for example. You may have this over Bluetooth. Google also has uh, uh, an actual plastic one. It looks a lot like a Yubi key, but it's like 10 bucks cheaper. <laughs> so you can have that. And you can even get really fancy ones um, somewhere around here, I have a fate and here it is. So this guy is really nice because it's got a fingerprint sensor on it and uh, you can oh. actually sign in with that. So it's fully biometric. Uh, the sad thing is it runs about like 80 bucks. Um, so there comes a kind of point of diminishing returns where it's not as exciting. But what has happened is Apple uh, and Google with Chrome have put in what's called a platform authenticator. Uh, you can actually go down here. And so I'm on webauthn.me. And if you go to debugger, this is uh, some specific things as to what the request is from what's called the relying party. So the relying party is the web page that's actually trying to authenticate you. And it's talking to the user agent because they had to reuse names that don't make any sense. But the user agent is the browser. And the browser then actually negotiates the conversation with the authenticator, which would be one of your actual FIDO keys that you may be using. In this case, you can go down here and you can just hit register and it says, hey, do you want to use the touch ID? Apple, I, I almost want to say this is a bit of a dark pattern because if you wanted to use a third party security key, you have to go to the left and actually know that you want to use a third party security key. So they definitely seem to be pushing you towards using the platform authenticator. And there's goods and bads to that. Whoops. And I just crashed Safari, which is one of the bads. Uh, so let me bring up another Safari window. <laughs> Here we go. Now we're back. So if I hit register, I can hit, if I hit register, oh, wow. I'm really, uh, it's really angry at me now. So let me switch to Chrome and you'll get a very similar experience. So if I go to webauthn.me here um, and I can go to debugger and I can cruise down to register. And now I've got a prompt. Uh, and this is maybe not quite as uh, kind of promoting the platform authenticator here, right? Because I do have the option of doing a USB security key or the built-in sensor. So if you did have a Yubi key or something else like that, that would be the uh, USB. Uh, otherwise, you can do built-in sensor, and now you get a prompt to you know fondle your Touch ID here, and so I can do that. And then you actually get the contents of what's coming out. So down here at the bottom, you can actually see this is the transaction. And if you've used a smart card before, this ends up looking very similar. What's going on is you're creating an elliptical curve, a P256 key pair in the authenticator. So the FIDO key, whatever it is. And you're using that to actually just sign a statement. Um, there's some specifics to it where it takes, you know, who's sending you the challenge and here's this challenge, which is some random information. But you're effectively signing that with the private key that's ensconced on, these have a secure enclave, in the secure enclaves on these FIDO keys. And then that's proving to the web page that you in fact have that authenticator and you're able to use it. And you can see here's the raw output of some of these pieces that are in here. And then if you wanna make sure and see if it works, you can click on authenticate here and it tries to replay the same thing now that it's made a key and see if you can actually prove that you have access to it. And so here you get prompted and you can click on it and here's then the output for that, right? So it's kind of a fun if you wanna play around and get an understanding of what a FIDO key does. What's annoying is if you're a third-party developer, like perhaps myself, and you wanna do this in your own app, um, it's not very easy because um, here I've got a little application um, and man, I've 
I've got so many projects open in Xcode. I have to go find this one now. Uh, there we go. Go there and here and there it is. So I've got another little app here. Um, and I grabbed it before Apple changed the syringe emoji. Uh, it's now not as bloody. Uh, and it, it was kind of funny. Uh, but I grabbed that for an icon because you got to have an icon, right? So here's a uh, real basic app that just opens up a WK web view, which is Apple's, if you're a third party developer, you don't want to bring your own HTML rendering engine and all this other stuff, right? You want to make it very simple. So to make it very simple, Apple gives you a class called WK web view. There's an older one called web view, but don't get those two confused because the older one doesn't work as well. Um, and WK web view then allows you to kind of run a web browser within your own app. And if you've perhaps seen um, Steve Heyman or some of the Apple folks, they'll give you a demo on, here's how you too can learn Xcode and make a web browser in five minutes or less. And effectively what they do is they just drag a big WK web view window in there and make an app. Uh, so that's what we've got going on here. So in this case, and you can see the emojis changed because the uh, actual icon here is a little bit different than the actual real emoji now in here, now that I'm on 11.3 beta four or whatever it is. So I'll turn off this injection. And if you go to debugger, um, let me do a reload. Uh, this is what you'll see if your browser does not support FIDO keys whatsoever. You get a little sad panda here saying, sorry, uh, sucks to be you, uh, you don't get to play. Uh, however, uh, you can, with a little bit of JavaScript injection, uh, teach uh, the app that you can do anything. So if I click this little inject button here, and I just do a reload, uh, I can actually go in and now it thinks I am actually able to do uh, FIDO keys. Uh, and that's because I, I actually am. I put in a, my own FIDO engine into here. And I'm kind of of two ways about this. On the one hand, uh, it'd be really great if I could just use Apple's Fido engine for free and I wouldn't have to bring my own code and my own crypto and everything else to it. On the other hand, as you can see, when I tried to use it a few times and it crashed all of Safari, uh, maybe it's not the worst thing <laughs> if I have the option to bring my own Fido compatibility into this. And in this case, now that I'm injecting a little bit of JavaScript that says, hey friend, uh, I do in fact have a Fido key and I'm able to use it. I can come down here now if I click register, you can see that I can actually go through the exact same process as before. What's different is that I'm kind of lying a little bit. Um, and <laughs> in, in the Fido spec, uh, and that's why you'll see it on the YubiKeys, they have some sort of thing you touch, right? Um, and this is why when you see that strange uh, one-time password hash show up in Slack, uh, it's because somebody accidentally touched uh, their YubiKey on the contacts and that generated that one-time password. FIDO keys are supposed to have something that you touch to prove that there's a user there. Because the concept is if there's not a human there, you probably shouldn't be doing that authentication operation. And in fact, you're probably being fished or somehow otherwise being abused uh, during that process. But if um, the web browser, I can lie and say that in fact the user is present. And so what I can do here now is if I can go back to authenticate, um, I can now kind of click on authenticate and boom, I'm done. And I didn't have to touch anything. Um, and the reason why I'm interested in this is I'm actually kind of interested in this as a device trust methodology. Currently, all of our device trust methodology is using certificates, right? So you've got a certificate in the keychain. You've got to be able to do something with that before you can go to the next step, right? If you're using Okta or um, some of the other, Ping now has one uh, that you can do for conditional access. A lot of that is predicated on having a certificate in your keychain, in theory, that's not exportable um, and that can then make sure that you're on that device that you think you're on. Um, I'm kind of curious is, you know, could we use FIDO keys for this? And since I can inject my own FIDO keys into this process, it very easy, it's very easy to be able to say that I can do that. And a best example of this is if I go to uh, an Okta page that I have here, uh, octapreview.com. So this is an Okta tenant that I have. Um, I have a couple of them, but this is one of them. Uh, and I can sign in, this account should work. Um, if not, we'll pick another one. And I can sign in here and it takes my password 
And then it says, hey, you need to use a security key. So this one I've already used. Let me actually do another account. This one is the one I'm looking for. So I can sign into here. And this is a live Okta tenant. Um, and I can punch in my password. And once I do that, it says, hey, this is the first time you're signing in. You need to register a multi-factor element to be able to continue this process. Well, since I'm injecting here, I can actually just go click setup and then I can configure factor, enroll, hands up here, and now I'm enrolled and I'm actually signed into Okta. Um, and which this is really nice because if I sign out and then type my username back in and just hit next and pull down to security key or biometric and my hands are up here and I've signed in automatically. And that's with using a FIDO key that I'm actually setting up. Uh, and it is backed by the Secure Enclave. So it is actually a better device trust methodology. Um, if you've done any cert work with the Secure Enclave, it's kind of a pain in the butt to turn a key in the Secure Enclave into a cert in your keychain. And so by doing this through FIDO, where we're not doing any sort of keychain work, Instead, um, programmatically doing this through a little bit of Swift code that's interacting with a little bit of JavaScript. Now I've got passwordless authentication to Okta uh, and it's based on the device. So it's uh, kind of cool and kind of fun to play around with. Um, it's something that I'm certainly looking at a little bit more, like I said, from a device trust or just from a modern authentication. Um, whereas Okta has certificate authentication, trying to do certificate authentication with Azure is kind of a bit of a pain, uh, but in Azure, this is called Windows Hello. Um, Windows Hello is effectively Microsoft terminology for a FIDO key uh, that you're then able to use to sign into your Windows 10 system, uh, to your Azure account and everything else like that. So it's kind of interesting. I, I think it could be kind of fun and you can see if I show keys, uh, I've been playing around with this a little bit on this one, uh, even set up some keys from Azure here. Um, so it will accept my platform authenticator as a FIDO key. It doesn't know any difference because um, it, it does everything it, it thinks it should do. Um, so I, uh, any questions on FIDO before we kind of move into some iOS stuff I've been playing around with as well? Keep note that if you have questions, you're muted. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> and for Surge, I'm going to eat an onion. There we go. As long as I don't have to smell it. And then I get move over my beer. Are you are you good on beverage, Joel? Do you need I'm to... good on beverage. Okay. So all right, with no questions. So Fido is something to keep a look at. If you haven't picked up a YubiKey, you should, because they're fun to play around with. Uh, you can get one of these fancy ones that has um, a USB-C port for your modern Macs. Um, this one runs about 50 bucks. Um, and it should have... If you can see the little radio waves on there, it will do NFC as well, because we're about to talk about iOS here and how that kind of factors into all of this. Um, what you can also get, and I'm not as, nobody from YubiKey's on this call, right? Um, I'm not as big of a fan of this, but you can get one of these, but they run about 70 bucks, uh, but they do have a lightning port. The problem, even though this is made for lightning, so this is an MFI adapter, if you do have, and I don't have my iPad down here, but if you do have an iPad, um, this USB-C, if you have one of the newer iPads, this is not MFI enabled. Uh, and that's not a YubiKey problem, that's a Apple problem. Uh, so you can't plug this USB-C one in and expect it to work, but you can use the uh, lightning one and plug it into an iPhone or an iPad that has a lightning port and it will work as a FIDO key on that device. Um, so this is something to keep in mind. But otherwise, as David is, is already using a little bit of it, these will work as smart cards as well. Uh, so if you do want to play around with and have some fun with what a smart card is like, although I don't recommend getting into smart cards as a uh, form of pleasure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, no, no kink shaming here. So uh, everything uh, up to you. But uh, you do have some options there as you can play around with. Uh, and they do work well as one-time passwords. Um, you can get some other ones that are kind of fun. This is why I said it was a Fadian, uh, and it's got, I think I'm getting that name wrong, uh, but it has a full-on fingerprint sensor here. Uh, and this one works over Bluetooth. The problem is uh, Apple never liked the Bluetooth, so Bluetooth never worked with Safari, and Chrome had Bluetooth working, but then decided they wanted to move into a bit of a different direction. 
So I don't know that a Bluetooth FIDO key gets you much anymore. But this one does have a USB-C port that you can plug in as well. This will not work, however, as a smart card. And then I got another one over here. This one I could never get to work, uh, but this is for you, David. This is a smart card and FIDO key combined. And it's actually got a Bluetooth. If I press it, there's a light that's supposed to turn on. So it actually has a Bluetooth element inside the card, but you do have to recharge the card because there is a battery in it. No. <laughs> yes. So it will work as a smart card. It's thin enough to fit into most of the uh, uh, readers, but to charge it, you have to have a special reader that can actually charge the battery in this thing. Uh, and then it'll work as a Bluetooth FIDO key. Um, so yeah, as you can see, there is a Bluetooth logo up there. How long do you have? What's how long's the battery on that? It, I, uh, just, I don't know. It seems to be dead I just right shared now. It. I just <laughs> shared it in the chat. The battery life, if you charge a dem card one time per month, the battery will have 80% of the original capacity after 10 years. So you just charge it, quote, one time per month. There you go. So it's probably good Whatever for that 30 means. days. <laughs> <laughs> this one is out. I was hoping that I could press it, but I didn't find it that useful. Um, so whatever. Uh, and the other thing I'm kind of playing around with, YubiKey sent me one of these. This is one of their HSM modules, uh, which you can then use. It looks a lot like a normal YubiKey, but it's $600. Uh, and this is designed for being plugged into servers. So you can actually have, this is effectively a uh, T2 chip. Um, it's not, because it's not from Apple, but it is a secure enclave. Uh, on a little USB uh, device. So you can put this into your server uh, and then your server could have maybe your intermediate certificate from your CA or something like that. That would be secured in this secure enclave here. Uh, and then you'd be able to do it. And the thing I'm curious about this is um, if you've been following like Tim Perfett or myself on Twitter, we've both been kind of playing around making smart cards show up at different places. And he's got a kind of cool app called Signing Manager. Uh, and the kind of usefulness of it is if you are a, uh, if you have a bunch of development servers, right? Uh, your organization makes an iOS app. And if you make an iOS app, you have to have a build farm somewhere. And that build farm has to have your Apple certificates on it to be able to sign the apps. But if your build farm is Amazon or your build farm is EC2 or whatever, right? You've got a bit of an issue because now those certificates are, which are somewhat sensitive. I mean, somebody could impersonate you and maybe ruin your reputation by uh, putting out malware signed by your Apple developer certificate. Uh, so you wanna kind of maybe take a, make those a little more secure. So one of the things is you could actually put these on a YubiKey. And if you didn't have that many developers, the developers could actually have your, uh, Apple developer certificates on one of these YubiKeys and you know put them in. So you can do that. Uh, Tim's got a great app called Signing Manager that allows you to put it somewhere else. And it just does an API call back and forth. The other option would be to take something like this, an HSM module, put your Apple developer certificates in here. And then you have a physical thing you can put into whatever your Mac mini at, you know, Mac aquarium or something like that would be uh, that you're using for your build farm. Uh, so a couple of different ways of doing that and maybe better, right? Cause uh, you probably don't want to know, but the number of shops that are using bamboo Jenkins or one of those CIDC solutions that are just copying over a key file. <laughs> and maybe a password in there. There's a lot of them out there. So maybe do a little bit better job of doing this. All right. So now that we've talked about this on the Mac, let's go chat about this on iOS a little bit. Uh, so I've got a phone here um, and it's got an app on it that I've been playing around with as well. So starting with 14.2, Apple came up with something called persistent tokens. So I can actually make a smart card show up on an iOS device, um, which could be interesting, could not, all right? Um, so I got a little app that uh, just allows me to do this. I've created a certificate in the Secure Enclave here, so you can kind of see that. Uh, but I've got a certificate on one of these YubiKeys. So this guy with the little NFC thing here, I can go into here and I can say, add a certificate from NFC and the digital signature cert, and I can just kind of touch this in the back here. Oh. And it actually puts a reference to this certificate inside the iPhone. 
So here you can see it, I've got the information, I can see the public key, this is an RSA key, this particular one uh, that's in here. So now that I have this, let me go into Safari and uh, quit out of this one. And I'll open up a new private browser. And I got a little Bluetooth keyboard here to make this easier for me to type these things in because I'm getting old and my fingers are fat. Uh, so I can hit to uh, a web page that I have that's just a uh, uh, requires uh, certificate authentication, uh, nomad.menu, cert test. And what happens now is when I get there, it actually says, hey, uh, you're maybe trying to sign in with a certificate. Would you like to actually use that? And I can say, please use this certificate, hit continue. And I've got a pin prompt. Uh, it looks slightly better on the phone itself because you can see there's an actual uh, keypad there uh, that the sharing doesn't show. So 8675309, call Jenny. Uh, and my app will come up and prompt you to go back to the app and then take this and touch it on the NFC sensor on the back here. And so we're actually doing an NFC operation, uh, just doing a signing operation that goes back. And now I'm back to Safari and you can see that I've actually signed into this page. So if you do have certificate requirements, um, this is maybe one way that you could get that certificate to show up on the actual iPhone. So you'd be able to use it for browsers and things like that. While we're here, we should look at something else because this app also has, I already showed it off on the other one, uh, but we have uh, ADFS, nomad.menu curb test. Uh, this is a Kerbero single sign-on extension on iOS. So if you did have sites that required Kerberos authentication, God help you uh, if you're on an iPhone, because prior to this, you never had a chance, right? Um, Apple's built in, got a single sign-on extension, but I've not had great luck with it. Uh, but this is one that would allow you then to sign in with certificates that might be in your secure enclave, or if you had a username and password. I'm not actually on the VPN, so this won't work. Uh, but you get the idea that this is a sheet that pops up when you go to a web page that requires a Kerberos authentication here. Um, and it's, it's interesting. I don't know that there's a lot of use for this, uh, but I'm sure some of you have still Kerberos authenticated web pages because they were connected into AD. Uh, and nobody's gotten around to updating them and moving them to modern authentication. But you can actually set that up here. So that's in here. But what I'm actually a lot more interested in, I've been playing around recently with a, a small step. It's an open source certificate authority. And what's nice about it, you can run it on your own. And this is on a Debian box inside AWS. Uh, but you can run it on your own hardware. Uh, put your own certs, and maybe if you're fancy, you can have it use one of these. Uh, I haven't taken it out of the package yet, I should, but it's got these little hologram seals on it, which are kind of fun. Um, plus, I don't have a, I don't have a port uh, anymore uh, for one of these. I'm going to have to use an adapter uh, to be able to use my uh, YubiKey HSM on it. Um, so small step will actually take authentication from a cloud identity provider. And here you can see that I've got it set up for both Okta and Azure. And if I click Okta, I might've changed things under the cover. So if this doesn't work, I'm letting you know beforehand, but I think it should. Uh, so I can hit continue. And now it takes me to an actual Okta sign in. Uh, oh, and I've got my keyboard. So I don't even have to put in, uh, I don't have to henpeck here. And I've got Okta set up with uh, factor sequencing. So all I've got to do is actually pick up my other phone and uh, gaze longingly into the face ID sensor. Uh, all right, yes, it's me. So now I'm signed in and I actually have a certificate that I've just generated with the private key in the secure enclave on the phone that's coming from a cloud authentication. So this would be called the derived credential. I've signed in with a different credential. In this case, it's a cloud authentication to Okta but I've used that to create a local credential. So a derived credential here. So, and this is an actual elliptical curve certificate. Uh, the secure enclave on the iPhone and on the Mac, but uh, more relevant for the iPhone for our conversations here, only handles elliptical curve cryptography. So if you have an RSA key pair, which is probably what you're used to from smart cards or other sort of public private key sets, RSA keys do not go in the secure enclave. 
uh, Secure Enclave doesn't have any support form. So if somebody tells you that they have an RSA key and it's secured by the Secure Enclave, that's usually a bit of hooey because uh, it's not actually secured by the Secure Enclave. It may be protected by something that's in the Secure Enclave, but the key itself is not. In this case, it is an elliptical curve key. It's in there now. And if I go from here and I go back to my web browser and I go to another page, I got to remember this. Uh, HTTPS, search, camp, SSO, com, uh, 8443. I think this is the one. And let's see if this takes it. Uh, oh, did I mess this up? Wow, this gets angry at you, doesn't it? Uh, view the certificate. Oh, it's passing it through. So I did this, I did this poorly. Uh, but you will be able to authenticate with these certs, uh, just like I did with the one that was coming in off the uh, YubiKey. Uh, it's nicer if it's in the Secure Enclave and it's local on the device, you don't have to do this. Because while tapping a YubiKey or if you have a, uh, this one, if you have a contactless smart card, that will work as well. Because actually a lot of the modern smart cards have an NFC element in it. Uh, most of them just haven't been turned on. So if you do have a smart card that has an NFC element, you are able to actually use that with uh, the iPhone as well. Should be able to do that. And then you can sign into these pages. The cool thing and what I'd like to do more with, and if I go back to one of these, uh, you can see the actual date that this certificate was used. And this is the certificate that came off my YubiKey. Uh, because when the certificate actually performs an operation, in this case, signing a little blob so that the website knows that you actually have the private key, uh, it's my code that's actually doing that. So my code is able to actually record when you did this, um, which means uh, whenever a certificate is used, I know about it. And next steps are gonna be putting in some sort of conditional access flow here, where if you're not on iOS you know, 14.2 or whatever that you've determined through a profile, you wouldn't actually be able to use that credential to be able to sign into those web pages. Instead, you would be blocked because I would give you the hand and tell you you had to do it some other way. So I think there's a lot of interesting aspects in here. Um, what I don't have set up on this Mac, but we do have the ability to do peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. Uh, so if you have a smart card in a reader set up on your Mac, I've got another little client app for it that runs on your Mac and can actually share this smart card to your phone. So you could sign into web pages on your phone based upon what might be on your smart card. If you have a YubiKey that does not have uh, NFC on it because you've not paid the extra five bucks, this one, for example, does not have NFC, you'd be able to plug this into your Mac, have the certificates on there, and then be able to do this. If you had your certificate in one of these, for example, uh, which you cannot plug in and does not have NFC, you would be able to plug that into a Mac and be able to share that. Uh, the other thing that we're looking into it is um, for clinical workers, uh, maybe you're in a hospital, maybe you're um, at a uh, hotel or someplace where you're given an iPad or a phone, and that's what you're using for the next eight hours, right, for one shift. Uh, that's what I like about Small Step. If you look at this certificate and you can see, uh, whoops, that's the NFC one. Uh, go back here. It's actually only good for about, I think I set it to be for a week. Uh, but we're looking at what if you had a cert that was only good for eight hours. Uh, when you signed into this shared device, you'd be able to authenticate through your cloud identity provider. We would create a new certificate that would be stored in the secure enclave on that device, but it would only be good for eight hours for one shift. So when you were done with that shift, whether you handed back in the iPad or whatever else, uh, you would be shut out from all of your resources that you would otherwise be able to get to. Um, and so this would uh, be kind of maybe an interesting idea for shared iPads or for anything involving shift work uh, along those lines. Um, other angle that we're kind of playing, playing around with here uh, for businesses, um, you've got wireless, you've got VPN. Now that I've got these certs created, I'm able to go into um, VPN settings for here. For example, go to general, go to VPN, add new VPN configuration, user authentication to certificate, and if I go here to certificate, these are the actual certs that I've created in that app because they've been effectively injected, maybe injected is too strong of a word, um, added to the uh, system keychain. 
So all the Apple apps, uh, Safari, uh, VPN, Mail, um, and wireless will see these certificates and allow you to use them uh, for those operations. So one example here would be, uh, maybe you get a brand new phone, uh, you'd go to an app like this, you would sign in with your Azure, your Okta credentials, whatever it is, generate a new certificate that would be again ensconced in that secure enclave on that phone, uh, but then you'd use that for wireless. Uh, so you wouldn't have to worry about changing your password every 90 days that it would catch the wireless out. Uh, and you could use that um, for as long as, as much as you wanted. Uh, maybe you have a setup where when you're visiting an office, you would just go into an app like this, click, you know, give me a wireless certificate for uh, Bangkok. Uh, you'd be able to do that. It would be stored in the secure enclave. And then this device would be functional for that period of time uh, until that cert expires. One thing we're also, I'm also looking at is I think I can renew the certificates when you use them. Uh, because again, it's my code that's engaged when any operation happens on that certificate. So it'd be very easy for me to turn around and actually do another API call back to small step if you're using that for CA. We've also got some support in here for uh, Secure W2. If anyone's using them, they're another great uh, cloud uh, certificate authority. Uh, and we do also have support for Entrust, um, which has their own derived credential system. So that way you'd be able to then get these certificates, pull them down, use them locally until they expire. Uh, but I think I can even set up single use certificates so that as soon as they get used, I burn them, uh, but then get a new certificate from the CA. So if you're ever naughty, uh, there's pretty much zero time that you would be able to do an authentication uh, before you would be locked out again from that account. Uh, and if that you know device happens to walk away or something like that, at most they get one authentication with that certificate, assuming they can pass whatever biometrics or whatever you may have imposed on there. Uh, so with that, uh, questions on this? We probably went to some directions people weren't expecting here, uh, but these are uh, some of the things I've been playing around with the last couple of weeks. Yeah, let's open up the floor for everybody. Uh, if anybody's interested in questions, I didn't see any come in in the, uh, the chat, but there was a lot in there. So um, I'd like to hear if anybody has any questions. Wow, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Either I went up here or I went down here. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, We're we're EDU, so we don't use any of this stuff at the moment. So I'm just kind of watching with interest, but also uh, I don't want to say horror, but I'm so glad <laughs> I don't have to deal with any of it. So, yeah, we do have a lot of EDU here. Um, like a good amount of people on this call are probably EDU right now, but. Um, well, but we, all of your, yeah. what's the EDU wireless setup? It's got a funny name, Edubome. Oh, Edu I know we don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but EduRoam, right? That is the solution mm -hmm. for um, wirelessly roaming across all of the universities that bought into it. I think it's a fair yeah. amount, right? Yeah. Yes, you have. And that's backed by a certificate, correct? No idea. We, we don't have it, so. Look at you, Mike. No, wait. <laughs> it goes, well, if it, goes it was. Back to, it goes back to the home university's radius, so they get to choose. So, but they How could they have a certificate that would. Are we talking about Edurom? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's yeah. the Edurom? Oh, hey, Johan. <laughs> Howdy. Sorry. Uh, my uh, old university was in the process of implementing user-based data to that one X with certs over mm -hmm. Edurom. But yeah, basically, it it's a it's a mesh network of radius servers with one radius server basically per university, and then it's whatever you want to do for the radius server. It doesn't really matter. It all just links back to that home university via the domain name that's used on the mm -hmm. authenticating users stuff. And yeah. every roaming academic um, calls the help desk of the university they're visiting to ask for help, and you have to explain to them they've got to speak to their own university. And every university gets to have a competition to see who can make the the poorest <laughs> choice with how they implement it. It's, it's well, amazing. It's fun. It's, it, it wouldn't be fun if it was any other way, right, Marcus? Exactly. <laughs> the, the thought of them implementing smart cards into that system would just fit beautifully with their and overall to be implementation. Very, very clear. I have no interest. I mean, 
we may play around with we've got a couple of gov customers and and that we may chat with about this but i'm not excited about this as a smart card enabler because i don't think smart cards are the future by any means i am interested in the idea of it being a soft or a persistent token soft is the wrong word because it's backed by the secure enclave so it's no longer a soft certificate it's a full-on hard certificate maybe that sounds weird but We'll go with it because um, it's actually backed by hardware. It's not just a private key floating around on an SSD somewhere, but it is an actual piece of hardware that is, you know, protecting them. And what you can't very easily do right now, right? So if you're using MDM and you've got an iPhone and you have a SCEP profile or something else like that, none of those certificates are actually in the secure enclave. That's the first problem. Second problem is they're really hard to use and generally annoying because the SCEP profile doesn't really get you a lot. Um, so what we're looking at here, and I don't think even SMIME email, anybody using SMIME email? I'd ask for a show of hands, but I can't see everybody at the same time. But my guess is there'd be maybe one or two hands up because um, SMIME email never really took off the way people had hoped it would be. So nobody's actually getting certificates anymore for email. And I don't want to use it for email either because to use a certificate for email, it's gotta be an RSA cert. RSA certs don't go in the secure enclave. So then you've got this other little dance that you've got to do. But I like the concept of, I could check out a certificate for a specific period of time to use for wireless or for VPN. And then I would be very confident it would be stored in the secure enclave. So I have a device trust element now uh, for being used for VPN or for wireless. Uh, and then since it's my code that's being run whenever that certificate is being used, um, that's where you can get into the conditional access uh, aspect to it. So if you're not on a particular version of iOS or something else like that, you then have, you know, conditional access as to whether you get access to these sites and things. Does that maybe make more sense uh, from a practical use here? <laughs> Any other questions? Mark has left. Did, did, did I, I fill enough time for a normal meeting was about an hour and change, right? We're in an hour and a half. Yeah, about yeah, we, yeah something like that. We usually plan for two hours and we never go that long because, right. you know. Well, so we plan for two beers and sometimes only make it to one. <laughs> Cheers. Coors Light, Johan, wow. I, Only the best for Johan. I know we know that. I, I don't know if I should be impressed or upset. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just like, I just want to throw back to like, like my college days. Cause that's basically was like a year ago. So <laughs> I was about to say that was like six months ago for you. Wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's basically right. Yeah. And you're, would, would you consider yourself FinTech now? You've left the education oh, yeah. world. Yeah. FinTech. FinTech. I've, there been, you go. I've been through everything now to some degree. I've been if through you're FinTech, I've you should be drinking good. better than a Coors Light. I mean, no offense to people <laughs> so, who like Coors Light. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you know, Joel, you, actually you do know, jo Johan worked with um, with my company for, yeah. um, like yeah. as a contractor for how long, Johan, were you there? Six, Six months. months? Yeah. yeah. So he did some gov work with us. Um, so we, uh, so uh, we're in the process of going through and replacing all of our old, uh, we have HID, tokens which if anybody mm -hmm. uses hit on mac os they know it's terrible because um they still use activex to uh, uh activate all their tokens which is yikes um but we've uh we've recently rolled out a uh, product called um i don't know i guess it's a it's an id wallet it's something similar to what you sh what you were showing before joel uh mm -hmm. where you can um you basically have uh, i don't know if anybody's ever seen one of these things right otp Yep. Right, one-time password. Um, not not it's super modern, but they work. Right. Well, no. Th so this is the old thing that we had. Uh, the new one is a app on your phone that acts as an OTP, but also it acts as a um, you know where it's a push OTP, right? So you yep. you authenticate. You it asks you for your PIN. You put your PIN in, and then it pings you on your phone and says, "Hey, just authenticate." You hit OK. Great. That's awesome that we have that, but we're still using the old infrastructure of HID and everything. But we are moving to YubiKey. Um, so I, I'm always anxious to see what new things you have uh, to show about with uh, when in terms of this because I've never actually used it until I came to this job and okay. um, I always find it fascinating. Well, this is the other thing. I, I these haven't even come out of the box yet. 
Um, and my wife is gonna love it because I'm gonna put an RFID reader uh, on the bathroom door here. Um, but this is Open Path, which is a newer, uh, and I gotta get like, I gotta find a wire strippers. These were a little more uh, like uh, non-software based than I was expecting. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, a couple of actual door readers here because I mean, what a concept. Maybe eventually we'll go back to an office um, because the HID cards are completely different from these smart cards. And the HID cards are actually, uh, hopefully no one's from HID here, but they're, they're kind of, ugh. Um, and you can actually have a lot of fun. Uh, it's over there, but you can actually pick up for like 40 bucks an NFC reader for your Mac. Uh, and if you get Kali Linux uh, has it built in, but there's a few open source projects that will actually clone your uh, office badge cards. Because if they're the HID ones, um, they're, they're pretty easy to clone. And in fact, since I brought this up, I should actually go. Uh, I'm sure my security will love this, by the from way. From <laughs> Amazon. If you, um, one thing about this, if you ever look up Deviant Olam from the Black Hat conferences, oh, he talks about this so much. It's the greatest thing. Deviant this Olm, is an HID O-L-M. cloner. Oh my God. <laughs> um, and so- That was easy. Yeah, it's got a little, it's even got a little, uh, you know, elastic here. So the card fits on and uh, you can tell it's, it's straight from China. It's very loud, <laughs> but uh, yes, I will not do anything illegal with this. Uh, thank you. And you can actually put your building badge in here. Um, I don't even know where my building badge is anymore. But the thicker ones are usually the HID ones. And those really don't have much encryption at all. They're just a number that's on there. So you can slide it into here. And if you buy this for 50 bucks on Amazon, you get like a couple of blank ones um, and you can just clone uh, until you run out of blank ones. Um, And those are pretty easy. You'll also get some of the key fobs. and uh, there's also the, so the, there's my fair cards, which are, um, they're higher frequency than the HID cards. And some of them are encrypted, at least in a little bit better way. And that's where you need Kali Linux. But if you put Kali Linux on, uh, it's got a couple of things. And like I said, you can get these projects on their own that will crack those cards. Um, I think it took a day and a half to crack my one for the office. Uh, Cause we have a building pass that's HID that this was able to clone without any problems like two seconds. Uh, and then the actual office badge was a little bit better. That took uh, a little bit longer, uh, but it was like a day and a half of just, I had an old Windows box that I put Linux on and then ran this tool, put the RFI, RFID reader on it. And it just sat for a day and a half and it brute forced effectively the uh, authentication on those MyFair cards. Um, so that was a little bit easier. This will try to clone MyFair cards, but it won't do a very good job of it. Um, but it is very loud, but yeah, 50 bucks. And I think you can find a bunch of them. Uh, make sure you pick the one that has English in the title <laughs> or else you will be having to uh, guess. Pro, pro uh, tip, yeah. Years. Yeah, uh, they go through there. But this is kind of fun, uh, fun to play around with that because uh, eventually what I'm, I'm trying to do, uh, as you can see what I did with the YubiKeys, there is an NFC element in here. Uh, and you can see this one actually thinks I'm going to go to a web page. Uh, there is an NFC element that you can work on. Uh, I'm not real confident I'll be able to get it to work with one of these touch uh, um, sensors or these NFC sensors here, but uh, we're going to play around with it for a little while. And like I said, my wife's going to be really excited uh, to go into the bathroom. You're going to have to have a key fob. Uh, it'll make everyone think we're back in the office again. You'll feel great. What, that's not your office? <laughs> well, this is now, absolutely. I've been banished to the basement. I was too loud on all my conference calls. So I couldn't be in. I find that hard to believe, Joel. <laughs> oh, look, this even comes with a bunch of door badges. Um, so yeah, I could probably clone these actually, since we're here. Let me pull one of these out. So uh, this came with the door reader. I just opened this box up and you turn this on and you slide this in. And once you and you hit scan, and it will try to scan what the card is. Oh, does it not see it? You read can see failure. it. Oh, read failure. Oh, I, let me hold it in the whole time. Scan. 
Um, and you can see it cycling through the different uh, kilohertz that are uh, what these usually go on. But this is good. If it fails, that means maybe these aren't clonable. Uh, because these open path, open path is um, kind of a tech startup, I think. Um, so it would be the um, Uber to, no, that's not the right way. What's, uh, what's something that's uh, barely got any product in the field? Um, I don't know. It would be something to the um, dinosaur company, uh, which would be more along the lines of HID. So they're trying to take over some of that. So it'll be interesting. Fun base to the chase. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we'll see what happens there. It's the Robin Hood to the... Uh, um, <laughs> Goldman Sachs. Uh, Goldman Sachs, exactly. Uh, cool. But if, if you haven't played around with it and you have any interest in kind of a hardware aspect, the YubiKeys, some of the smart cards and some of the other stuff, uh, can kind of be a fun distraction if you're looking for a quarantine project or something else. I'm going to put that back in the box. Cool. Nice. Yep. <laughs> the amount of jalapeno onions. So, <laughs> so you're yeah, I've had jalapeno two onions. ciders, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm working on this beer now, so we're good for a bit. Mm -hmm. Is that from the uh, from the keg? It is from the keg. I uh, it having a kegerator during COVID is either a blessing or a curse, because uh, you got to drink a lot of beer by yourself. Um, <laughs> else, it you know nah. you feel bad if the beer goes bad. Mm. You don't want that to happen. Mm -mm. Um, so yeah, this is I like I said I think it's the last one. I got a I got a hookup on clown shoes, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, so this is the mango Kolsch, but I'm hoping I can get one of the more fun ones. Mango uh, Kolsch, that actually sounds really good. It's a nice, I mean, it's a bit more summery than what I currently have outside the window. Yeah, like the Clementine. Like 55 <laughs> degrees. So this was better. Uh, but we had snow like two days ago. Mm. Not gonna lie, when you say clown shoes, I just imagine you literally wearing like gigantic red clown shoes. I could do that. One of those should come, like if you get a keg. You should, get, you should get a free clown shoe. <laughs> I'd be game for that. Well, with that, any other questions? All right, I don't see anything in there. So I'll hand it back to uh, John. I'm going to hand it to Serge, actually. <laughs> there you go. It's all good. But I, I will say thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Joel. Thank you. Always fun to do thank this. You. Um, Thanks, it's Joel. always cool to kind of chat about new things uh, and stuff that hasn't materialized yet. Um, and hopefully give you something to play with and think about as you go forward here. You know, now that now that you pass it off, I'm going to I'm going to be the jerk. Uh, I do have a question. Um, how long? So what are you thinking on a timeline for Nomad 2? Um, for like GA or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I would be very surprised if it took me longer than the summer. The problem is it's mostly just fitting it in on the, you know, it's a yeah. passion project. It's a passion project, yeah. Um, and I blame Johan. And if he put more work into it, then we'd have it faster. Uh, so it's all his fault. Uh, we and, obviously should have just uh, kept them on at, at at my company, so he could uh, <laughs> so he could he could futz around and uh, do no, uh, he... his passion projects too. <laughs> so um, I would, I mean, a lot of it's there. What isn't there right now is the automatic sign in uh, and ticket acquisition, um, because again, part of that changed somewhat dramatically with the uh, multiple accounts, uh, and then I gotta add a little bit of logic. I gotta clean up a little bit of it. The LDAP lookups, because those are taking a little bit longer sometimes than they should. Uh, but other than that, a lot of it is cut and paste. Uh, I think the bigger lifting is done with like the single sign-on extension and things like that. Um, the PAM module will actually probably be a part of Nomad login uh, because the PAM module ends up being a security uh, mechanism. Uh, which is what mm. Nomad login is already delivering. Right. So you could install Nomad login, but not actually use it for the login window. Ignore that if you don't want to. I mean, you should, but ignore that if you don't want to. Um, and then you'd be able to use the PAM module from there uh, to be able to do that work. And, and I have a comment actually about Nomad login with um, M1 machines. I don't know if you're aware of this. Um, so if you, 
So on, in our environment, we use Nomad login for mm -hmm. notifications only. Mm -hmm. And if you use Nomad login to do that um, on an M1 machine, it works, it loads, it shows everything. Uh, it doesn't show the progress bar, but that's a big sort of thing. Stop talking. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> but it, um, when it goes back to login window, if you log in with File Vault, it won't yeah. automatically log in. And there's so we've got a pass through. Computer. Definitely play. I put a one five, I think, or whatever beta RC something in the cool. channel because uh, we figured out how Big Sur, well, specifically the Apple Silicon, changed that. Um, we were using some EFI calls. Uh, this is probably more esoteric than you care. Uh, but prior to Apple Silicon, um, you had an EFI entry that said, this user had just signed in through File Vault. So get the username from here and then the Mac figures out the password. Uh, with Apple Silicon, that's slightly different. It's, you won't be surprised by this, not documented. Uh, but uh, with some careful spelunking, we now have that. So that version of, I think it's like 1.5 RC2 or something like that, that's in the Slack channel, scroll back a little bit. Um, that should fix that. So you will get the pass through if they do sign in through um, uh, File Vault. So please take a look at that. And it also hopefully addresses, uh, I was thinking you might also go with, an, I don't know if it's specific to the M1s, I think it's more Big Sur that the screen gets sometimes a little bit off center, um, which doesn't really impact functionality necessarily, but it doesn't look good. Um, so I've put in some more centering code um, that we can actually detect when the screen changes. And I sat here for a while. Uh, I've got an M1 and I've got an Intel system over here and uh, plugged and unplugged screens and uh, it was always in the center. So I think that, that we're in, in good shape with that. So please take a look at that. If, if that doesn't solve it, uh, let me know. Um, but if nobody complains about it, we'll make that uh, production. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of sad thing, right? If yeah. nobody yells too much on Slack, uh, we we make, we ship it. That's how OSS works, though. So. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and yeah, because Apple's recommendation was, oh, just delete the auth DB. I'm like, that's not a good solution, yeah, Apple, thanks. That seems a little bit much, yeah. Especially when you're in file vault deferral. It doesn't work, it breaks things. So. Ooh, yeah. fun, I hadn't thought about Ooh. that angle. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. So, but no, thanks for that. I will definitely take a look at that. So, yeah, no problem. Please let me know if it works, or at least let me know if it doesn't work, because um, then we'll take a look at it again. Uh, but yeah, that's in that one five um, RC there. You got it. Joel, did you test with the uh, the EULA enabled? Because I think that was our issue last time. I did because I remember that absolutely. And uh, I found maybe that we are forcing the EULA when we shouldn't be. So I found some other issues, but the EULA was always centered. <laughs> Perfect. I think usually it was like it. <laughs> this, the screen resize would then like, um, like it was the EULA and then the screen resize would like repop the normal login window over the EULA, but not enable the buttons. You can only see the, the button. And I didn't see any of that. Cause I, <laughs> funny you mentioned that. Cause I was going through the code and in the code was, uh, yeah, this didn't work uh, with the EULA. And it was commented out. And uh, I did it differently this time. Uh, I so it. I did run the EULA a number of times, more than I think I'd ever done in the past, uh, <laughs> as I was plugging and unplugging monitors. Uh, and it all was pretty good. So uh, confidence is high. Perfect. Or your money back. <laughs> it will send you a big fat check for $0.00. .00. <laughs> I, uh, I, I downloaded Robin Hood. Uh, Charles Edge like was uh, telling me I, I had to be uh, cool and millennial. Uh, and so I bought uh, 0.00000009 Bitcoin or something like that. And I, and I think I've made $3. Uh, I, I didn't use code base, uh, Coinbase, Johan, so apologies. Yeah, uh, but good. if you've got a referral code, send it my way. Oh, absolutely. All right. I got a uh, referral code. <laughs> Employee <laughs> referral codes, okay. Because <laughs> Robinhood gave me a free stock. It's not a stock I've ever heard of before. Uh, for Coinbase, if you join, um, there's like an earn program where you can earn like 40 bucks of crypto in like 10 minutes. Beautiful. Do I have to so click every, something? Everybody ask Johan for No, I'll put my referral code invite. in chat. Give me like 10 seconds, okay? <laughs> um, like, you'll all get my referral code. No problem. This, this is why we, we come together for these meetings. This yeah. is great.
This is it. This is the reason. Cool. So, well, with that, um, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, it's always, like I said, fun to chat about these things. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully, like uh, soon, we'll be able to get together in the same room again. Yeah, that'd be good. I, I you know, and I, I pitched this. I haven't chatted with the Macaduck folks yet, um, but I think it'd be cool. So I got I got my first vaccine. If you follow me on Twitter, and not many people do, but that's fine. Uh, I I because I'm old enough. Uh, age has its privileges. Uh, I was able to get my shot um, Tuesday. And uh, I'm thinking conferences this fall, right? Because Serge, you went kind of through the conferences that were coming up. Um, I think it'd actually be good to get the presenters together, even though it's probably still too early to get the participants together. Um, And that way panel discussions might be a little bit easier. I mean, everyone's got a bit of Zoom fatigue uh, after all this. and getting the panelists together would be good. And maybe that would save my airline status. Because, uh, uh, you know, you we just buy a ticket last year. Everybody, everybody lost all their miles. Yeah. <laughs> I lost all my free hotel stuff. So, yeah. So. yeah. And, and totally unrelated, uh, since you did bring up conferences, if anybody's interested in doing like a panel of any sort, I'm always, I, I am going to be putting in for jnog npsu this year um but if anybody's got any ideas and they want to pair up or something like that i'm here right, johan says we have to buy 100 bucks of bitcoin ah um, nah. and then we Thomas, get 10 bucks if you sign up with an account like i consider that a win uh right off the bat but <laughs> i'm just saying like that's that what came with like when i like shared it to myself to then share it to zoom it, like that was mm. the whole like jargon that came with it <laughs> Um, yeah, Joel, I'm right there with you. I qualified into like the the K through 12 like coaching. People. Oh, yeah, oh, very cool. Well, every state's different, right? I mean, I signed up in the Minnesota page. I signed up in my health plan page. I signed up in a few other pages, and then my wife got a hot tip that Walgreens had them. Um, hmm. And I go to Walgreens, and boom, like 20 appointments, and I got it in like two days later. Uh, slight soreness. Uh, but I hear the second one is a bit more, uh, I sp- strategically yeah. plan, uh, maybe, maybe Mike will cut this out of the recording. Sure. Uh, I, I strategically plan the shots for one of my least favorite calls. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a great way to get out of whatever uh, conference call you may have to, uh, oh, it wasn't our call shot. <laughs> 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 not this call. Absolutely not. I already got it. Yeah, the I heard a lot the same thing from a lot of my friends. That the second shot was the one that like kicked them on the butt. Yeah, um, put them down, and then the first shot just really just aggravates your arm a little bit, and you basically got dead arm for like twenty four hours. But yeah, I got all right. <clears throat> I'm gonna go walk the dog, and that's not a euphemism. Cool. <laughs> so we got so we got about fifteen minutes, so I was gonna open up the floor for everyone else. So. Uh, and we'll let Joel go here so he can go walk his dog. Hey to Joel. Thanks hey again. Joel. See you. Thanks, Thanks Joel. again. Doing Thank it. you. Thanks, Joel. Appreciate it. Thank you, Joel. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, Chad. Oh, man. I didn't see you there. <laughs> uh, no, right. that was great. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, anybody have anything they want to talk about or bring up? Or I, I just have a question. I don't know if we want to continue to record, but, uh, and I want to talk to you about this tomorrow, Serge. Uh, Joel's still with Jamf, but he still does Nomad. Yes. And I'm just like, I, and that kind of puts me in a gray area because I'm a Jamf customer and I we and we pay for Jamf Connect PKNIT. And yet <clears throat> I'm talking to him about Nomad.